Hello, I'm JW. This time it's Surge Protection, and I'm going to be looking inside this uh, book here, BS 7671, and specifically regarding that calculation as to whether you need Surge Protection or not. And that's the one with the uh, picture there of the uh, lightning map and all that other bother. Now, uh, this uh, isn't particularly complicated, but uh, in reality, it might not actually need to use this at all because this calculation is only used if a whole pile of other things aren't actually met in the first place. So the reality is that while this calculation exists in there and is valid in some circumstances, in the vast majority of installations, you don't even need to go and get to this particular calculation because you'll already determine it via other means. So let's have a look at that and uh, see what the calculation is about. And we'll also do a quick demonstration of uh, actually doing the calculation and seeing what kind of results we get from it. Now here's the one regulations, the uh, 7671 2018 version. This is the original one, there's an amendment one which we haven't looked at yet but we uh, will be looking at later. However that amendment one only covers one particular individual piece of this so it uh, doesn't make any difference to what we're talking about here. Now this particular thing is in chapter 44 which it says here is protection against voltage disturbances and electromagnetic disturbances. And if we turn through the pages a bit there, then we get to this. Nice map here of the uh, UK, and this basically shows you the likelihood of lightning occurring within various areas. So basically the darker it is, the more likely it is going to be happening. So uh, obviously certain areas over here it's going to be very likely. If you live over here in the southwest or whatever, probably not. And if you live in the north of Scotland, then uh, probably never going to happen at all. And then over here is some of the uh, things you need to calculate and the length of cables and all of that. But uh, before we get into all of that, I want to have a look on the previous page, which uh, starts here. And this is 443. 443 starts over this side, which is protection against transient over voltage of atmospheric origin or due to switching. So important to realise, as we've seen in previous episodes, that there's two real sources of these. Lightning, which is the atmospheric origin here. And most of the time that's not going to be literally lightning striking your house or building or whatever. It's more likely going to be lightning striking the ground somewhere. And that causes voltages to be induced on underground cables and so on. And then the uh, other one due to switching. So if you're going to turn on large loads within the installation. So like motors for a lift or something like that. Or even big banks of LED lighting. That uh, can also cause the transients as well. So if we move over to this side where we've got over voltage control. Which really gets into the... Uh, thing on the following page there. I want to realise that this calculation only applies to things of atmospheric origin. So if you've got an installation where transients due to things being switched on and off is going to be happening, this calculation is of absolutely no use whatsoever because it only deals with the instances of things like lightning outside of the installation. So straight away if you're going to put the surge protection in because of switching you don't need to do this calculation. It's completely irrelevant and unrelated. Now we've got four things here to consider, so 443.4 over voltage control, protection against transient over voltage shall be provided where the consequence caused by over voltage could, and then we have four different things here to consider. So first of all results in serious injury to or loss of human life, results in the interruption of public services and or damage to cultural heritage, results in interruption of commercial or industrial activities, or affects a large number of co-located individuals. So if any of these things apply, again you don't need to bother with the calculation because you've already determined from these that you need to install surge protection. So if you actually look at these things here, these cover a vast number of different types of installations. So let's have a look at number three for example, results interruption of commercial or industrial activity. So pretty much in that single line you've covered all kinds of shops, offices, factories, computer centres and all this kind of other stuff. Because clearly if you're going to have a surge going into any of those buildings, it could cause disruption to whatever that business happens to be. Even things like a little corner shop, if a surge goes in there and destroys their till, they can't serve any customers or take any money. So clearly that's not a good situation. So that in itself covers pretty much all commercial and industrial installations. This one at the bottom, a large number of co-located individuals. So that's things going to be like hotels or big blocks of flats or anywhere such as that. And the other things here... Again, you're going to be covering things like your hospitals, any kind of uh, sort of municipal buildings, that kind of thing as well. So if any of these apply, don't need the calculation because you've already determined here that you need surge protection. Now, most of this doesn't necessarily apply to individual dwellings or people's houses because generally it's not any of those items there. So if we continue on here, for all other cases, 
A risk assessment according to 4435 shall be performed, which is the calculation here and on the next page. If the risk assessment is not performed, the electric installation shall be provided with protection against transient overvoltage. So basically, if you're not going to be bothered to do this calculation anyway, even if you've suddenly found somewhere that wasn't any of these and you couldn't be bothered to do the calculation, then the deal is you need to put service protection in anyway. And then the only exception, except for single dwelling units, in other words, somebody's house or their flat or bungalow or whatever else, where the total value of the installation and equipment therein does not justify such protection. So essentially it's going to be any of these apply, you need surge protection. If you don't want to be doing the calculation, you need surge protection. If it's a single house, which is pretty much everything that's not included on this one at the top, then you don't have to put it in, assuming the equipment and the installation itself doesn't justify such protection. Now, bearing in mind that for a domestic installation, your typical cost of surge protection is going to be in the region of, say, £100. In that case, it's quite probably less, particularly if you're putting in a new consumer unit anyway. If you're just going in to put surge protection in, then it's going to cost a bit more. But putting in a new consumer unit in a house or bungalow or whatever, it's probably going to be around £100 or so to put the surge protection in that. Now, total value of the installation does not justify. So you're basically saying that any house or single dwelling doesn't have more than £100 worth of equipment in that could be damaged. Now, pretty much that's no house anywhere because a single television is going to be hundreds of pounds, maybe even thousands if it's the... Uh, latest sort of OLED model or whatever. Everybody's got televisions in their houses, everybody's got phones, everybody's got computers, and even other stuff. You've got all kinds of electronic equipment within your installation, even things like, say, a refrigerator. It's not just a thing that turns on off anymore, it's got those electronic controls on the front, and if those are damaged, well, you need to buy a new fridge, don't you? So this uh, value exemption is really a load of nonsense, because unless you're going to have a house that doesn't have anything in it, which is, let's face it, never going to happen, then you need to put surge protection in. And then the final part here is that protection against switching over voltage shall be considered in the case of equipment likely to reduce switching over voltage or disturbances exceeding the values according to the over voltage category of the installation. And there's some examples here where low voltage generator supplies the installation or inductive and capacitive loads, such as motors, transformers, capacitor banks, storage units, or high current loads are installed. So even if you don't want to do this and that doesn't apply and you don't want to do this and all the rest of it, even then, you still have to consider the fact that this is only for things outside the installation, so typically, or lightning there. But anything that's going to be turned on and off that's likely to cause switching over voltages, again, you need to put surge protection in. And it's important to note here that things like capacitive loads, in most cases, includes LED lighting, because most LED lighting is a capacitive load, and if you have a large amount of LED lighting, when you switch it on, there is a massive inrush there and that can cause disturbances on the supply. So even in a normal house, if you have a lot of those LED downlighters, say in a room, you've got like 15 or 20 of them in a big kitchen or something, even turning those on, just in a normal house, can be enough to cause over-voltages on the system and possibly damage equipment that is connected, even things like the lights themselves. So assuming you've got past all of this and you've found a place that doesn't apply to any of these and it's a house that apparently has nothing in it and all the rest of it, after all of that, if none of those apply then, you can move on to the risk assessment method and do the calculation. So as you can see, the circumstances in which you might need to do this calculation are pretty much one in a million. It's really not something you're going to be doing on pretty much any installation. There might be some ridiculously vague and indistinct things where someone may have considered it's none of those, but it's not something you're going to be doing that often. But nevertheless, we are going to have a look at it anyway, just to see how it actually works. Now this is the calculation here, it's all on this uh, little bit here. Some of these have to be calculated from stuff on the next page, which we'll look at in a moment. So essentially calculated risk level, which is called CRL, is used to determine if protection against transient overvoltage of atmospheric origin, notably not things within the installation, is required. CRL is found by this formula, so essentially we've got three things in here. F, ENV, LP and NG. So essentially it's FENV divided by the other two multiplied together. So it's three numbers, multiply two together, one divided by the other, and then you'll get some number here, which then is used uh, to determine whether you need it or not. And the three things you've got, the first one is an environmental factor selected according to table 443.1. And if we have a look what 443.1 is, it's over the top page here. So essentially you've got two values, rural and suburban, it's 85. 
and urban environments, which means your town centres and cities and whatever, 850. So getting that value, it's just a question of which one of those it is, 85 or 850. So not really any kind of mystery there. LP is the risk assessment length in kilometres. Let's see below, or actually on the next page. And we'll have a look at that in a moment. NG is the lightning ground flash density relevant to the location of the power line and connected structure. Figure 44.2. 44.2 is this map here of Britain. So in terms of getting this value, the NG figure, all you've got to do is locate on the map where the installation is located. So, for example, I'm located in North Dorset, which is just about here. That's that sort of mid-grey colour, so over here in the side, look, it's 0.5. So that's, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? And if you happen to live in North Yorkshire, say up here, that's a much darker one, so there you would use value of 1. And if you happen to live, uh, say, up here in the highlands of Scotland, then the value is the white one, and the value there is 0 0.1. So that's just a question of locating it on the map, selecting the appropriate value from here. So straight away we've got three values, two of which are very easy, it's just looking in a table or just looking on that map and then noting down what the figure is. So, say pretty straightforward so far. Now, LP, which is the middle one, is the risk assessment length, which is on the next page. Now, this is slightly more involved. Again, it's not, uh, not really too terrible. Now, LP, as we've got here, this is actually calculated from a whole load of other stuff. So the risk assessment length is calculated as follows. LP is equal to basically all of these things added together. Now, this is where the length thing comes in. We'll have a look a bit further down here. Here's a sort of a diagram of some typical uh, installation wiring. So high voltage overhead lines coming in. And we've all seen those across the various bits of the countryside. Underground high voltage cabling. Then we've got a big transformer here. Next part here we've got are the underground low voltage cabling. Then we've got some overhead low voltage cabling here. Got a bit more of the underground low voltage cabling there. And then finally we're actually at the uh, house itself. So there's four things involved there. And uh, have a look at the top here. So we've got the length in kilometres of low voltage overhead line, length in low voltage underground cable, length of high voltage overhead line, and length of high voltage underground cable, which I say is the things just got in the diagram here. So you need to find out what these lengths actually are. Now, if it's an overhead wire, of course you can just have a look and see and sort of estimate how long it might actually be. Underground ones is not going to be so easy. In theory, the DNO or the network operator might be able to give you some indication of these sorts of lengths. Another thing you could do is say, if you know where the transformer happens to be for the particular property, even if it's all underground, you can pretty much see where the transformer is. Say it's halfway down the street, and here's the house here, so you could get some kind of estimation of the distance across here. But uh, even if you don't know any of these things, then not really a big problem, because as we've got up here, if the network lengths are totally or partially unknown, then essentially all you're going to be put in is a distance of one kilometre, and you just make one of them, which is the LPAL one, equal to one kilometre. So if you know some of them, you just make that equal to the whole lot equals up to a kilometre. If you don't know any of them, you just make that as one kilometre and all the rest are zero. So it's not particularly terrible, it's just a question of finding out what sort of things you've got. And the main difference here isn't necessarily the length as much, it's more to do with whether it's overhead or underground, because obviously there's a difference in the likelihood of things being affected there. Now once you've got some of the lengths, or maybe none of the lengths, you need to put them in here. So those are your four lengths, so it's one, two, three, four. And all you're doing is basically adding these together. The only slight complication is that some of these have a number in front. So where it says two there, you're basically multiplying this value by two before you actually add anything together. So if you had, say, some low voltage overhead line, and for example, that was, say, 0 0.5 kilometres or half, then you actually put it in here, multiplying by two. So in that case, it would be two times 0 0.5, so that would equal one. LPCL, which is the underground cable we just put in as it is. And again, these two others here, whatever the length you've got is, you just multiply it by the appropriate value first. So in this case, you multiply it by 0 0.4. In this case, it's multiplied by 0 0.2. And these have been put in because presumably somebody has worked out that the different risk factors of whether it's overhead, underground, or whatever. So this is presumably more likely to have a high-risk thing. So PAL is the one with the uh, low-voltage overhead line. So that's presumably a higher risk to uh, 
have things induced on it. And uh, PCH being the lowest risk, because that's only 0 0.2, and PCH is the length of the high voltage underground cable. So it's all to do with risk factors, but essentially just multiplying it by the value in front of it. Once you've done that and you've got all four values, add the four values together, and that value is the LP, and that's the third thing which you saw on the previous page. So once you've got that value here, it goes into the thing on the previous page you've seen. So we know that that came from the table, we know that that comes from the map, and then LP is that value we just got from adding those four things together, and that goes in there. And then that gives you the uh, CRL, or the calculated risk level value. And then the only thing after that, once you've got this value, is whether it's greater or less than a particular value. And if we look down here, if it's greater than or equal to a thousand, protection against transient low voltage at spherical origin is not required. And if it's less than a thousand, then it is required. So all you're looking for is the end value. Is it bigger than a thousand or not? And if it is not needed, if it's less, then you do. Now let's do a couple of calculations just to show how this would work in practice. Now, first thing to think of course is where is the installation located and what type of installation it is. So for the first one we'll say that this installation is located in North Dorset. That's where I happen to live at the moment. And we'll say that this is a rural environment because most of Dorset is rural. So question first of all, looking on the map over here, here's Dorset at the bottom here and North Dorset is in this light grey colour. So straight away we can see on the side over here, light grey is value of 0 0.5. So uh, our NG value, as it's over there, in this case will just be equal to 0 0.5. And then the second thing we know, it's in a rural area, so in the countryside, not much uh, going on there. And at the top of this page, we've got this table, so rural environment, value of FENV, and we can see that's equal to 85, as that's a rural environment, so 85. Now the third item, of course, is LP, and we've seen before that's the sum of these various lengths of different types of cables, whether it's overground or not, and various other things. So bear in mind, all of these are limited to a maximum of one kilometre in any case, and if you don't know any of the lengths or couldn't identify them or whatever, then you, all you have to put in is basically that LPAL is equal to one, and then the others are zero. So we'll do that to strike first away. So uh, LPAL we know is going to be one, so if you look at the top here, we've got two LPAL, so that's going to be two. We know that LPAL is going to be one because that's the default value, two times one. And then the others are all basically going to be equal to zero because one being the default value. So in this case, it's going to be adding absolutely nothing. So it's just adding zero, zero, and zero. Now, of course, zero is adding doesn't achieve anything. Two times one is basically going to be two. So in this case, LP, which is the total we want, is simply going to be equal to the value 2. So that's the case if we don't know the values or can't find them or whatever, say cables are underground, can't see them and so on, just assume that that's going to be 1, which gives us a value of 2 because of course 2 times 1 is equal to 2. Now that we have our three values, we just need to put them into the formula here. So the CRL, or the calculator risk level, as we saw previously, is equal to F, E and V, which we know is 85. And that's divided by the other two values multiplied together. So it's LP, which we know is 2, multiplied by the other one, which is 0.5. 2 times 0.5 is 1, so it's 1. 85 is 85, of course. And of course, 85 divided by 1 is just 85. So in this case, the uh, CRL value is 85. And look on our previous page, so that if the CRL is less than 1,000, so pretty obviously 85 is way less than 1,000, then protection against transient low voltage of atmospheric origin is required. So in this case, it's going to be yes, they are required, because of course the value is only 85. And that's using the default, so we don't know really the actual lengths of cables involved. Now let's do that same one again. So we're going to have the same values there, so 85 for the rural environment, an NG of 0 0.5, which uh, if you have a look on the map here, it's all of the light grey, so it's actually a very large percentage of the country there. And there's very few areas actually where it's a considerably larger value. So same values again, but this time we'll say that we do know some or even all of the values of the cabling. So 
instead of it being overhead this time, or just using the default, which is basically the same as it's going to be overhead, we're going to say that we can see that the wires in the house are obviously underground, because we can't see them on poles outside, and we know that the transformer, this job over here, is about half a kilometre away from the house. And again, that's going to be pretty obvious and easy to determine. You can't see the cables, so you know they're underground. Generally, you can see the transformer. It's either in a building or some kind of enclosure somewhere else. So half a kilometre there. So our LP value, which again is the four things added together, we know that underground low voltage cable, which is the LPCL, that's the second item there. So we're going to have something plus 0.5 and then possibly two other things at the end. Now we'll say that we don't know what the high voltage overhead and underground actually is and we can't actually see anything else up to that point so we don't really know what's going on there. So as it says up here, being around the total length is limited to one kilometre and if it's partially or totally unknown then LPAL is taken as equal to the remaining distance to reach a total length of one kilometre. So the two end values for the high voltage cabling are again zero and then the one in here is also half because half and a half is of course total to one and we know that this first value has a two in front of it so if we just rewrite that in two times a half is one half is obviously still half the zeros don't matter so the total value is just those two added which is going to be 1.5 so it's a bit lower than we had before because we had two previously and now it's 1.5 mainly because we've got some of the cabling underground which of course is less likely to be subject to transients than something that's overhead. So again we can do that same calculation so the CRL is the FENV which we know is 85 divided by the other two multiplied. So in this case the only difference is it's 1.5 which is the value we've got here multiplied by the NG which is still 0.5 85 on the top, 15 times half is 0 0.75 and therefore the total is 85 divided by 0.75 so our total figure this time is 113. Now that's a bit bigger than we had previously because of course the value on the bottom is smaller because we had 85 so now we've got 113 but again that's way less than 1000 so again this is an example where it would be required. Now if we do the same thing again, it was an urban environment, again the only difference would be that the 85 becomes 850, so if that was 850 divided by 0.75, then the result again is just 10 times bigger, so essentially it's 1130. Now in this case that's more than 1000, so this would mean that it was not required, whereas this one is. So again it's basically that top value has a big impact on the output, so if everything else is the same, rural area, less than 1,000, we are going to need it. Urban area, greater than 1,000, so we're probably not. And most of mind, this is actually where you've got some underground cabling, which again is far more likely in an urban area. Now I'll just do one more, just to show you what would happen if you went to a different area. And for this one we're going to pick an area in Lincolnshire, which is right in the middle here, this completely black dot there, which is, must be the most unlucky part in the country. And that's going to be a value of 1.4 for NG. So in that case we know that NG is 1.4. Lincolnshire again is a fairly rural area so we'll start out with that F, E and V being 85 again for the rural environment. And then for LP we'll again assume that we don't know the length of the cabling or we can't see it so we'll just go for that default value we had before which as we saw basically works out as two times the maximum length of one kilometre, all the rest are zero, so LP basically is equal to two. So again we'll just do that CRL thing from that previous page, so CRL is FENV which is 85 divided by the other two multiplied, so it's 1.4 in this case and the default value of two, so that's going to be 85 divided by those which is 2.8 and you can already see it's going to be far less than a thousand because obviously it's going to be smaller and the value we get in this case is actually 30 point some uh, decimal points but the point is it's way less than a thousand so in that case yes it's going to be needed and even in this particular case even if it was the 850 on top that would just be 850 for the urban area Lincolnshire does have some of those and uh, divided by 2.8 and again it's going to be 10 times that so the result in this case 
it's going to be 303 is it decimal points or whatever so in this particular case mainly because we've got a much greater risk factor on the bottom here doesn't make any difference whether it's urban or rural it's still way way less than a thousand so in this case would be required no matter what and again if you had the various lengths of different cablings it would make a small difference to the bottom here but bearing in mind it's very likely going to be considerably less than a thousand in any case here simply the fact that if it's 85 on the top to start with to get anything over a thousand this value on the bottom is going to have to be incredibly small which of course is not going to be the case if you've got uh, 1.4 in there already and with 850 on the top it's not particularly difficult to get it over assuming you've got a fairly low risk factor for that so the thing on the top does make quite a big difference at a factor of 10 bits underneath make some difference but in the scheme of things not particularly significant in uh, many cases so there's the calculation as to whether you need surge protection or not so bearing in mind that first of all you've got to go through all those things on the previous page and decide that it's not any of those which already probably counts out 99% of installations and then if it's not any of those and it's not a house that doesn't have uh, anything of value in it then you can actually do the calculation if you really want to to determine whether surge protection is required or not and even then in most cases if you're going to be living or it's going to be located in a rural area then you probably will need it and in an urban area you probably won't and then even after all that even if you do want to do the calculation all that palaver you don't actually have to do it on paper either because if you go to the ECA website they've actually put a calculator on there you can just use you just fill in the lengths and the figures and it does a calculation for you so you don't even have to do it on paper at all even if you wanted to do it which is going to be extremely unlikely and probably never going to happen anyway so there's a calculation for you so although this is in the regulations and it know that is valid you're probably never going to use it it's not something that you can use every day or even every year because in most cases that previous page with those four items will cover pretty much everything and it's basically saying that in 99% of cases surge protection is required and if you find that rare random one thing where it doesn't fit into those categories then in theory you can do the calculation and then say oh yes we need it anyway or maybe not depending on where it's located now a link to the website in question is in the description of this video so let's have a look there you don't have to be a member of them or anything it's just uh, freely available and simply just fill in the figures and uh, press the button and it gives you the result required so that's the calculation there yes it's there but uh, in reality probably not going to be using it very often or even ever so that's it for this video until next time thanks for watching